The purpose of this podcast is simple. We want you to get to know your doctor before meeting them in person because you're making a life-changing decision and time is scarce. The more you can learn about who your doctor is before you meet them, the better that first meeting will be. There is no substitute for an in-person appointment, but we hope this comes close. I'm your host, Eva Shea, and you're listening to Meet the Doctor. Welcome to Meet the Doctor. My guest today is Dr. Kesha Varzi. Tell me how you say your first name so I don't embarrass myself. Reza. Reza. Reza Kesha Varzi. Thank you. And he is a weight loss surgeon, bariatric surgeon in Miami, Florida. And it, this is the first time we've ever had a bariatric surgeon on the podcast. So I'm very excited to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Very excited to be here. Now you're in the epicenter of a wild change in weight loss. Exactly. But I want to go back in time a little bit first and talk about bariatric surgery before we get to the hot thing. And um curious first how you got into it and what made you excited about bariatric surgery in particular? So it's actually kind of an interesting story. I was born and raised in Tehran, Iran, and my mom worked in a national Iranian oil company. So I grew up going to the hospital, not being sick and having the pleasure of snooping around, seeing different things, going to the operating room, playing with the toys. And I always knew I wanted to be a surgeon, but I didn't know what kind. So when I moved to U.S., I pursued medical school, always hung around with the plastic surgeons in the burn unit, thinking I'm going to go into reconstruction of some sort. Long story short, I ended up doing a general surgery residency here in Miami. After that, I wanted to pursue plastic, but financial and family issues led me into going to practice for a few years. And then at one point, I decided that was not enough. I wanted to come back and do a fellowship and there was an opening down here with one of the gurus of weight loss surgery, Dr. Moises Jacobs. And by coincidence, we met. I became his fellow. I learned from him how to do weight loss surgery. And I realized what I was looking for was really weight loss surgery. I enjoyed it so much. It was more rewarding for me than doing plastic surgery. And I'm in, still in Miami changing people's look, helping them emotionally and physically. And uh, somehow one thing to, you know, led to another. And I ended up doing this as a career. And that's all I do these days. I'm not going to try to guess your age, but approximately what year was this that you started doing bariatric surgery? So I'm 51 year old. I had a late start because I had to join the military in order to be to leave the country, then getting U.S. visas. So I did a non-traditional tract of medicine. So I was a little bit behind. But I started this in 2015. I graduated uh, from residency at University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital in 2010. I joined the Fisherman Hospital in the Keys and I had a year or two of that and then realized, no, I need to come back and do some training. So 2015, I did my fellowship and then subsequently I started my practice in Miami following that. But prior to that, you were a general surgeon. So you were still doing surgery all the time. Yes. And still after doing the training and starting as a weight loss surgeon, I continued to do general surgery as an emergency cause I still was active till I my 50th birthday. And I promised myself when I turned 50, I'm not going to take calls anymore. And that's coincidentally happened that I broke my shoulder on my 50th birthday. And that <laughs> led to another thing. And I use that as an excuse and stop calls. Oops. So I don't do any general surgery since I turned 50, which was about a year and a half ago. How did you break your shoulder? Skiing. That's not something Skiing. people... Okay. Skiing. I dislocated and broke my shoulder on the last day. Well, at least it was the last day. Uh, the last day, last minute of it. So it was good. Okay. So I have more questions. You moved from Tehran. Why did you move to the United States? Was that to go to medical school or was it to get out of there? It was to go to med school. Yeah. But I had a little short experience in U.S. when I was in second grade. My dad was a head accountant for National Iranian Oil Company. So we came to New York to close the accounts after revolution. So I went to school in uh, Queens for second grade and half of my third grade was in Orlando, deciding that we could should go back or not. Then we ended up going back and then I couldn't leave the country till I did my military service because it was during the war back then. What did you think of Orlando as a third grader? 
uh, it was fun. It was fun. Disney, you know, the oranges that my cousin used to grow in his backyard. All of those are good memories. Yeah, I bet. Uh, it was fun. And then when I came back, I knew I wanted to do medical school. So my uncle lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and he helped me with accommodation and getting my application and all of that. So that's how it started. So while you were doing general surgery, you were working in a hospital. What kinds of patients were you seeing there? Oh, we see it all. So I did my training here at Ryder uh, Trauma Center. So majority of the general surgery down here was focused on trauma. And then after in the practice, I was in the key. So majority of it was regular gallbladder, appendixes, perforated colon, hernias, and stuff like that. People on vacation. <laughs> Doing a lot of elective endoscopies, a lot of uh, fish hooks in the hand. Ah. From the fishermen's, a lot of infections. You know, just basically common general surgery stuff. So in 2015, in the beginning, bariatric surgery was pretty rudimentary. When I was a resident, it was a totally different ball game. It was mostly bypasses. The stapling technology was new, so we had a high leak rate. The learning curve was still there, was still being accepted, and a lot of people were just learning. And most of these surgical procedures have a steep learning curve. And now it's completely different. It's nothing compared to what I remember 20 years ago as a medical student. Those huge open bypasses, leaving two or three drains. The patient was in the hospital for a week. Now the whole procedure takes 20, 30 minutes, 5 cc, 10 cc, blood loss, no drains. Drops of glue on the belly. They go home in Thailand all day after. What leads people to seek bariatric surgery? I mean, obviously, being overweight is what. <laughs> but are there other factors involved here? Yeah, they are. So gaining and losing weight is, if you look at it from a physiological standpoint, every animal wakes up in the morning hoping they find more food that they need that day so they can store some fat when the food is not available. So we being a, you know, a mammal and food surrounds us, any mammal is coded in our DNA. When the food surrounds us, our body has one mission, to accumulate some fat because it knows the food's not going to be there in the wintertime. But evolution of farming industry and the food industry has been so fast that our body has not evolved. It still thinks there's going to be a winner that the food's not going to be there. So it sees the food there and it will tell every molecule of your body, eat more than what you need that day. So hopefully at the end of the day, 100 grams of fat is stored for the winter time. So all the animals, when the food is abundant, they gain weight. When they don't have it, they lose weight. They hope this balance makes them survive. So the weak ones, they can't play that game. The ones that don't have enough fatty tissue to store, they don't get access to good food. You know, that's the problem because our bodies has not evolved. The agriculture and the food industry has evolved. Calories are very abundant. And while that is around us, your mission is to gain weight. Now you want to tell yourself, no, food is around you. Don't eat because it's not good for you. So it's a constant battle. So these procedures don't make patients lose weight. They just give them an advantage over that physiological battle. So anybody thinks, oh, I'm going to get a sleeve, I'm going to get too skinny, I'm going to get a bypass, I'm going to get too skinny. That's not true because ice cream will, end of the day, still taste better than chicken breast. Now, these surgeries don't make ice cream taste bad and chicken breast taste good. You still have to diet, you still have to exercise, but it's very non-physiological to be surrounded by food and expect your body to easily shed weight. This is a battle. And most of us have a life outside of losing weight, and we put up this battle, and the battle cumulatively gets harder and harder as the hormones build up, as you lose more fat. And at one point, most of us give up and go back to our normal day. What has happened here is we've restricted our calorie, our body has lost muscle, now we lowered our metabolism, you gain it all back plus a few pounds more. So correct weight loss is difficult. Most of these yo-yo diets end up in losing net muscle and gaining net fat. Why does it seem so easy for some people to stay skinny and not for others, even within a, the same family? 
So those are different reasons. Each of our are born with a certain amount of fatty tissue. We can fill and deplete it. We cannot create and destroy it. So I might have a two by two storage and at 180 pounds, I might be diabetic, heart problems, and I will die. And somebody who has a 10 by 10 storage can be 400 pounds and still not have any issues. We run into trouble when we overfill our storage. So our genetic capability, how big can we get? That's given to us by our genes. How much fat are you born with? And, you know, there's a certain amount of filling you can do before you get sick. So I will never live to see 400 pounds because I just don't have that kind of capability. At 180, I'm sick. At 200, I will die. So you always see me as a skinny person because if I get up there, I'm not going to live. But some people, most of my patients, 270 pounds, healthy, walking around, no problem. That means they haven't filled up their capacity. So your body is desiring to fill that capacity. Fill your storage for the needy day. How would someone know what their storage capability might be? By their body buildup. Basically, you can see you pinch your, your belly and you know how much how much tissue you have there. You know, people that you pinch and very thin, you can but there's people that have tissue. And you can tell by how overweight you are and how sick you are. So let's say if your BMI is 40 and you're not taking any medication, you have a potential to be one of those super morbidly obese. But if your BMI is 32 and you're taking diabetic medication and too high blood pressure medication, that means you're spilling over. So your storage is very small. I see. So if your BMI was 40 and you really weren't having any issues at 40. That means, yes, you're healthy obese. (laughs) Your fat distribution is in, you know... It's in the arms, it's in the legs, it's in the areas that, that it's not toxic that much versus some people like me, my, for example. Mm-hmm. I keep, I'm five foot seven, I keep myself around 165 pounds all year long. At 186 pounds, which is about 20 pounds heavier, my hemoglobin A1C goes from 4.7 to 6, and my blood pressure systolic goes from 120s to 160s. So I don't have that kind of capability to get 250 pounds, uh, I will have a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And I have some pictures of myself on, on my social media about 186, very sick looking. How did you get to 186? So that was an experiment I did with oh, peanut butter no. and Nutella. Oh no, you did that <laughs> yes. to yourself. So whatever I do, I do to the, tell the patients, I try to do it myself. Hey, do you remember that weird TV show? Did you ever see that show where the personal trainer would gain the weight and then try to lose it? With a lot the- of people would do it. A lot of people do it. And this is the experiment we did just to see how much I can gain. And I, I, I got really sick after 20 pounds. This was 2015. 2000, yeah, 2015 when I was just doing the fellowship and contemplating starting this practice. How did you end up losing it? What did you do? The science of weight loss is very simple and it makes sense. It really does. So if you understand that each pound of fat is 3,500 calories. Each gram of fat is nine calories. We use fat because we can put double the calories in one gram of it. Protein, four calories per gram. Carbohydrates, four calories per gram. Fat, nine calories per gram. That's why we use it as storage vessel. It's 3,500 calories per pound. My basal metabolic rate is 1,700 calories per pound. If I eat 500 less, I say 500 per day of caloric deficit. Every seven days equates to one pound of fat. That's as simple as that. So with the goal of losing four pounds per month, all I need to do is be 500 below my basal metabolic rate. At 200 of exercise, you raise that deficit to 700 a day. Now you're losing six pounds per month because every five days, one pound. But there's a caveat here. You know what the caveat is? I'm waiting. Whenever you go in a deficit, there's a certain grams of protein that you have to consume. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between starving and thriving. Your body, if you shut down the calorie, can number one, think you're starving and goes after your muscle to lower your engine. If it gets enough protein, which is the language of our physiology, that means you're rich, you have nutrients in your body. It thinks you're thriving and it will go after the stored fat. So most of the people fall into the first category. They drink celery juice for a month and lose a lot of weight. Body thinks they're starving and all they're doing is downgrading that Cadillac Escalade to a Toyota Prius. Mm -hmm. 
What's the rule of thumb for protein? I've heard a lot of different ones. So everybody's individual. It depends on how much muscle you have. I have 77 pounds of muscle. My basal metabolic rate is 1,700 calories per day. And every time I go to deficit, I need 140 grams of protein per day. And that was by trial and error. Less than that, I will lose muscle. More than that, I sometimes actually gain muscle. Females average about 80 to 100. It depends on where their testosterone is, of course, and how their hormones are, thyroid function. If everything is optimized in a deficit, average female responds to 80 to 100 grams of protein per day. It's typically two shakes, two small meals, and a high protein snack. Okay, so let's say you're doing that and you're great at it. You don't cheat. You follow the process and it, you discover that it's still really, really, really difficult. Nobody said it was easy. I said it's possible. I didn't say it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's being something is possible versus something is easy. You can run a flat terrain. It's easy and possible. Climbing a mountain. It's not easy, but it's possible. So same thing. So weight loss is not physiological. No matter what, it's not going to be easy because you're going to fight your buildup. It's just any animal is designed to gain weight. Losing it is not natural. We're the only one that have that problem. Nobody else has that problem. So it's not easy, but with proper guidance, with proper knowledge and with proper tool, it's possible. Correct weight loss, there's a science to it. It's not easy, but it's very doable. So a motivated patient person that wants to change their life, it's very doable and it's very rewarding because our society does judge you. Things are difficult for most of these patients. Like simple things like crossing legs, tying their shoes, being comfortable in an economy seat in an airplane. All of those things, most people don't realize that how difficult it is when you're overweight. And the judgment that people do, the looks that you get, everything in life becomes difficult. And it's not their fault. And most of society thinks they're lazy. It's, you know, it's just very physiological to gain weight. Healthy people gain weight. Mm-hmm. It's a normal function of being a person. Yesterday, I was reading about an 18-year-old who could power lift or Olympic lift far beyond what anyone had ever done before. Mm-hmm. And it, the point was not that he worked harder. He did have a genetic advantage, and it does exist, but it's very rare. Mm-hmm. Very rare. Most of us are not that gifted. <laughs> we have no. to work on it. But they are ones that are born with six pack and they're going to die with six pack because they just don't have any <laughs> fatty tissues in their body and there's just nowhere to store it. So you started doing uh, in 2015, the primary mm-hmm. surgery you were doing at that time for weight loss was um, like a lap band or a gastric sleeve or what was it? So when I was training, Back in like 2000, early 2000s, like it was lap band and bypass. I trained with Dr. Moises Jacobs and he at that point has abandoned everything. He's, a, he's one of the pioneers in this field of weight loss surgery and he trained very great fellows. And he at that point was just doing gastric sleep. And he believed that most people with proper follow-up can, can get same benefits, even not more from gastric sleep. So I heavily trained on gastric sleep and the technology of the staplers were very good. We were barely seeing any issues with patients. And then I set my practice up solely doing gastric sleeves. Bands never, only remove them. And uh, I don't believe in bands at all. They were horrible. Bypass is a malabsorptive procedure, has a lot of consequences, and I don't choose it as a first line of defense. Gastric sleeve is anatomical from mouth to anus. Everything stays the same. We just remove an excess portion of the stomach that causes hunger and excessive storage of the stomach. So in a good hand, patients don't have a whole lot of symptoms. They achieve the control that they need to get. And with proper follow-up and education, it can be very successful, but not easy. And then a number of new and interesting technologies came along. And I happened to, you know, because I've been going to plastic surgery mm-hmm. meetings since the early 2000s, I yeah. see the bigger mm-hmm. things kind of come over to this side, to the plastic surgery side. So yes. I saw when the balloons came along and actually 
knew the rep for the balloon because he lived in Austin. The Apollo endosurgery is here. And so mm-hmm. I was familiar with them and, and what they were doing. So I do the highest number of balloons in the East Coast. At least I used to. Now there's a lot of people yeah. doing it. So I started doing that in 2016. And one year we did, I think the highest year, I did almost 200 balloons. Balloons are good in the right person, but it's not for everybody. Who's the person that it's good for? It's good for temporary weight loss. Let's say, you know, postpartum, wants to lose 25 pounds of pregnancy weight. Uh, You have a knee injury, you can't go to gym, you need to lose 30 pounds before you get your knee replaced. And then you can go to gym. For a lot of weddings, like people just (laughs) wanted to look good for their wedding. And, you know, they, they put that into their wedding package prices. You draw four or five dress size for your wedding, you know? That was a lot of people I saw using it for that. But if you want to change your life, balloon is temporary. It goes in there, it gives you control for six months with proper diet, 500 deficit per day, four pounds per month, 25 pounds. With diet and exercise, six pounds per month, six months, 36 pounds. Average female lose 25 to 36 pounds. Good for certain people. But most people, when they remove it, they eat again and they gain it back because yeah. nothing has been altered. But for plastic surgeons, it's good. They do it a lot before tummy tucks. Yeah. They need to lose 30 pounds before they do their tummy tuck. The patient's BMI is too high. They need to drop it to get for that tummy tuck BMI. They use it a lot. So let's get to the medications because that's over the last year has just completely exploded. No, oh, it's just, it's exploded like our volume is less than half of the people that used to get surgery now they're on medication so the medication uh what do you want to know about it they're horrible if you ask me well tell me why you think they're horrible so this is again another temporarily so the weight loss and weight issues are permanent issues in most people they're not just this year the next year will get somehow better When you start these medications, they're not helping you lose. I mean, let's let's take a step back. Only one way to lose weight, and that's basically eat less than what you burn so you can store those, to get rid of those stored calories. All of these bariatric procedures, one way or another, trying to help you tolerate that, either by putting a foreign body in your body that makes you full, by manipulating something that helps you tolerate small calories. Beta HCG was on 500 calories a day. So basically all of them boils down. You need to control what goes in. So these medications hit your satiety center, make you less hungry. Hit your gut GLP receptors, make him move slower. So now you're less hungry. And when you eat, you stay full longer. Same thing with the balloon. Less hungry, stay full longer. Same with the sleeve. Less hungry, stay full longer. So basically it's the same thing chemically. So anytime you control anything in your body with chemicals, your body always upregulates those receptors. You block it, body makes more of it. So it's called tolerance. 0.5 becomes one milligram, one milligram becomes two milligrams to get this certain effect. Then at one point, you're putting $500, $800 of medication every month into your body just to maintain your weight loss. Now your insurance will drop you because you started at the BMI that was indicated. Now you're normal. Your insurance will drop you. You have to pay the money. Guess what? As soon as you stop it, what happens? Now you have 10 times more receptors. All those receptors are screaming, feed me, feed me. And everything to eat goes through you a lot faster. So you're always hungry. So you gain pound rapidly. And guess what? Most of these people that are Ozempic, they're not in a practice like mine that they're watching their muscle mass, watching their BMR. So all of them are losing muscle, also known as Ozempic butt, Ozempic face. Now these, all of these people are going to be hungry, muscular, and also metabolism damaged, gaining a pound a day while they get off of it. So I have no idea. Next year, probably it's going to be millions of people coming in for surgery now. And these medications have consequences. Unfortunately, you're putting your trust in the pharmaceutical companies in America. As far as the patent is up, they won't tell you anything. As soon as that 10-year patent goes and they get their marketing and research and all of that money out of you, they'll tell you, oh, by the way, it does this, it does that, it causes this, just like Nexium. Purple pill was the best thing, you know, since sliced bread. 
Now they say, oh, it causes heart problem, leaches your magnesium, causes osteoporosis and all those bad things. Everybody was on purple pill. You went to the doctor, said my tummy hurts, there you go, Nexium. Same thing. You go to your barber, now they'll offering you some Chinese semi-glutide. You think that barber is watching your muscle mass, giving you correct nutritional advice? No. You're going to lose some muscle, some water weight, and most likely you're going to gain it back. You cannot address permanent problems with temporary solutions. It's good for companies, not good for the patients. I see a lot of people losing weight on it, though. Mm-hmm. One thing I've heard a lot of is about the food noise, that it calms your mind down from being hungry all the time and thinking about it food does. all the time. And it, that seems beyond what's happening you know, physiologically with your stomach. It does, but are you going to take this for the rest of your life? Also, other things that people don't think about, it's very clear on, on this says, if you have MEN, multiple endocrine neoplasia, MEN type two, it will cause medullary thyroid cancer. It will cause pancreatic cancer. Medullary thyroid cancer and pancreatic cancer are the most deadliest known of cancer in men. And nobody goes ahead and checks these meningenes before dispensing this medication. And it's clearly there. If you have history of MEN2 in your family, you can get medullary thyroid cancer. So tell me why somebody pays $500, $600, inject themselves on a weekly basis with poisons that can cause medullary thyroid cancer when they have an option of doing a 20-minute surgery that go home with Tylenol with proper training, change their life back. I'm baffled. I just like don't know what people like think. It clearly affected our clients. Like it, it clear affected everybody. Mm-hmm. I'm blaming it on the economy, not on the medication. But I know deep down it's the medication because all those people that need to lose 40, 50 pounds, now they're on medication. So how long they're going to stay on it? What's going to be the long-term results? I have a feeling one of these lawyers are going to have an ad on TV saying if you have semi-glutide or whatever, whatever, for weight loss and you know somebody who died, give us a call for a class action lawsuit <laughs> in the next few years. That seems to be classic. I was at the plastic surgery meeting in the spring and mm-hmm. in the room, in one of the big, big courses, like where everyone was in the room, thousand, thousand doctors. They said, how many of you are on it in this room? And 80% of the room raised their hand. I know. Everybody's on it. Mm-hmm. They're making millions and millions of dollars. And it's not cheap medication. And the counterfeits coming from China, from Canada. And God knows what's in that stuff because nobody's looking at it. And there's no regulation. There's no regulation. You're just buying a white powder and you're putting it in your body. And most people, I don't know, they, you know, our body is the most precious possession we have. If they buy a Ferrari, they put expensive, they buy expensive car. I'm not even going to go Ferrari. They put like the most expensive thing. They spend money on cleaning it. Their body, they go look for the cheapest food on the aisle. I don't know why. Most people don't have respect for their body. Just think it's given to them for free and it's going to work perfectly for the rest of their life. Yeah. There's clearly a lot more to unpack here. So we're going to have to come back and do do some more on this topic. I would love to. I would love to. I was thinking about starting my own podcast too. So I'm in the process of it. Oh, you are. But it, it's, a, it's a great idea. You know, I, I feel very comfortable talking like this, but I just don't like sit in front of camera and talk. Before we wrap it up, what do you like to do outside of work? You have a family, you have kids, but what, what do you do for fun? I have one son and a family, but my passions are two things, skiing and cave diving. Not going to give up the skiing even after you took your shoulder out? Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> that actually ignited more fuel into it. And cave diving? Did you say cave diving? There's nothing that terrifies me more on planet Earth than scuba diving in a cave. Oh, you should, you should watch some Bahama cave videos. Bahama and Mexico have the most beautiful decorated caves on, in, on earth. Stalagmite, stalactite, beautiful rock formation. Do you have photos of your own cave diving adventures online anywhere? Yeah, not a whole lot. I, I didn't used to post a whole lot of cave diving, I uh, think, because of life insurance issues. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> that at this point, I, I don't care. So I have one on my uh, private Instagram. Uh, it's called Vegan Surgeon. And uh, I posted something there. And you're vegan too. We didn't even touch that. Yeah. So actually I started after breaking my bones, I started adding some uh, more animal products. Yeah, I had started Annie, but I was very, very strict vegan for now four years and now a year and a half of partially. The joints hurt. That's mm-hmm. That was what I noticed. I needed to add some collagen peptides to my diet. These are all, all things I put in the category of youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> and the things we don't know that until... Until we need to know them. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Keshavarzi. It's a pleasure getting to know you today. Oh, you're welcome. This was a pleasure. If someone's looking for you and wants to potentially come see you, where can they find you online? We can find us on www.miamivipsurgery.com or on Instagram is Miami VIP Surgery, our handle on Instagram. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Good talking to you. If you're considering making an appointment or are on your way to meet this doctor, be sure to let them know you heard them on the Meet the Doctor podcast. Check the show notes for links, including the doctor's website and Instagram to learn more. Are you a doctor or do you know a doctor who'd like to be on the Meet the Doctor podcast? Book your free recording session at meetthedoctorpodcast.com. Meet the Doctor is made with love in Austin, Texas, and is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.